This is a talk on aqueous humor, the anterior chamber anatomy, and the ciliary body. And just as a disclaimer here, I'm not going to talk, I'm not going to have tables with all the different chemicals that are involved in the aqueous and the serum. And not going to talk about cellular anatomy in great detail, more how we look at the aqueous inflow and outflow from a clinical standpoint. So we know that the aqueous humor supplies nutrition and removes waste from the clear structures in the anterior eye, the cornea and the lens, structures that really can't have blood vessels going to them. And the balance between aqueous production and aqueous outflow determines the intraocular pressure. And this drawing is going to appear really throughout my curriculum. It was drawn by Lee Allen back in the 40s. And it's a painting or drawing that was taken from histopathologic slides, so it's quite accurate. And I think if if I can get you and me to just remember this drawing, it'll it'll do us good in terms of understanding the anatomy. We're going to be talking about the ciliary body, and we're going to be talking about the outflow system in the iridocorneal angle. And the angle, of course, is the angle that's made up by the clear cornea and the iris. And sitting within the angle is the trabecular meshwork in the ciliary body face, which is where the outflow occurs. So the ciliary body is made up of multiple structures. There are the longitudinal muscles that we can see here that pull on the scleral spur right there, and that opens up the trabecular meshwork here to increase aqueous outflow. The circular muscles of the ciliary body accommodate the lens, and that's why when we give things like cholinergic agonists, such as pilocarpine, to lower the intraocular pressure by pulling on scleral spur, we also cause the eye to accommodate, which is really not what we want. The ciliary body is part of the blood aqueous barrier, and it also forms hyaluronate for the vitreous. The ciliary epithelium makes the aqueous humor, consists of ciliary processes of which there are about 80. You can see them here. This is a slide of a patient with aniridia. And in aniridic patients, there's just a little stub of iris, but it gives you an uncommonly good view of these ciliary processes. Aqueous humor is made from plasma, and it's made by the non-pigmented epithelium of the ciliary body. So the process starts in the stroma of the ciliary body where the is the, where there's very uh, abundant vascular supply with fairly leaky vessels that provides lots of plasma. It moves into the pigmented epithelium and from there into the non-pigmented epithelium. Notice that the epithelial cells are apex to apex with the basement membrane on the both outside of both cells. And from there it goes in, becomes part of the aqueous humor. There are three basic mechanisms by which this occurs, active transport, ultrafiltration, and diffusion. As the name implies, active transport or secretion requires energy Sodium is driven into the posterior chamber and water follows. And this is also responsible for moving ascorbate and other large charged molecules into the aqueous humor. Ultrafiltration is passive, where fluid moves via micropores in the cell membranes, moving along gradients and is pressure dependent. And then diffusion is passive it's lipid soluble materials driven by concentration gradients. On average, around two microliters per minute. This goes down as we age. It decreases as we sleep. Inflammation causes us to, to decrease as we break down the blood aqueous barrier. 
There are a lot of very subtle differences between aqueous humor and plasma, but there are two main differences. Aqueous has virtually no protein, and that's why it's crystal clear. And if you do get protein in the aqueous, then that becomes flare because you can see the light traversing the anterior chamber. But normally you cannot see the light beam traversing the anterior chamber because there is no protein in the aqueous or very little. If you have inflammation, then the blood aqueous barrier breaks down, and that obviously changes that dynamic. The aqueous has 15, 10 to 50 fold the levels of ascorbate that, this, that the plasma does. And then there are tables of all the other differences, but they are relatively minor. So we can see here the fluid is flowing from the ciliary body. It's going to bathe all the structures in the posterior chamber. Going to go through the pupil into the anterior chamber, will bathe the cornea, and ultimately will reach the iridocorneal angle. And there it will exit by a two routes. Primarily through the trabecular meshwork into the episcleral venous system. This is pressure dependent. So this is a higher magnification view of the iridocorneal angle. The trabecular meshwork has three components, the uveal, which are these fine strands that go from the iris up to the cornea, fairly lacy. Then there's the corneal scleral meshwork that bridges between scleral spur and the cornea in this region. And then there's the juxtacanalicular tissue, which is more compact and forms the inner wall of Schlem's canal. And it is felt to be the area of most resistance to outflow. And then the fluid goes into Schlem canal and from Schlem's canal goes into the aque aqueous veins and out into the venous system. The other route of egress is through the ciliary body face and the iris root into the suprachoroidal space, and this is pressure independent. And that's right here. If we look back to the same drawing now, the thin blue arrow into the face of the ciliary body into the suprachoroidal space. This is a small percentage of aqueous outflow, around 10%, although there are studies that suggest it may be higher than that. The intraocular pressure then is a balance between production and outflow. And Goldman equation basically just says that the intraocular pressure is the rate of aqueous production in the ciliary body divided by the facility of outflow. The facility of outflow is the inverse of the resistance to outflow. And you can measure this with a device called uh, tonography, which is almost never used anymore, except for in the setting of, of studies, plus episcleral venous pressure. And so what this should mean to you is that you really can't lower the intraocular pressure lower than episcleral venous pressure if we're talking about conventional outflow. So if you have somebody whose pressure is 11, and you're thinking that you might do trabeculoplasty or put them on a drug that will increase aqueous outflow, you're not going to make the pressure lower than episcleral venous pressure, which is somewhere between 8 and 10 millimeters of mercury. So below episcleral venous pressure, PV, so below 8 to 10 millimeters of mercury, all outflow would be uveal scleral, and the pressure needs to get above 8 to 10 before there is any outflow at all through the trabecular meshwork. So this is just an overview of the flow through the anterior chamber just to get you oriented to begin your studies of glaucoma.